Welcome to the video recording of F Sharp Data Structures for Xamarin University. My name is Glenn Stevens and I'll be taking you through today's course. Now before you begin, there'll be a number of exercises that we will be going through, so you should have downloaded the class materials from university.xamarin.com. Okay, let's get started. This class is going to focus on the most common data structures that you'll use in F -sharp, Arrays, lists, sequences and records. And we'll be looking at how to construct each of these types, what they're useful for, and when you'd choose one over the other. And we're going to break it into two pieces. We'll start with arrays and lists, and use them to process data. Then we'll look at other data structure types we use to manipulate and transform information in our programs. Let's get started by looking at the two most common structures that you'll use to hold data. And recall that in the very first session we looked at loops, the for in and the for to statements. So while these are perfectly valid ways to process iterative sequences, it turns out that arrays and lists in F-sharp can be processed much more functionally. So let's take a look at how we do exactly that. And we're going to look at three big things. First, we'll examine the simplest of the data structures, arrays. And these are the same array types that you use in C-sharp, but with some extra functionality added on by the F-sharp libraries. Next, we'll switch over to lists. And lists are similar to the, the generic list class you're probably familiar with, but these are not implemented in the same fashion, and as a result have some unique capabilities exposed by the F-sharp language and libraries. And then finally, we'll compare the two approaches and see where you should prefer one over the other. To start with, let's define what an array is. An array is a fixed size, zero-based, contiguous, mutable sequence of items, which are all of the same type. And when you create an array in F-sharp, the compiler will generate a system.array, and all the features of system array are available here. In fact, you can even use the array class in your code, just as you would in C-sharp, or pass these arrays into C-sharp code for processing. And like C-sharp, the data must be homogeneous. It's strictly typed and bound and verified at runtime. There's a built-in syntax for creating arrays in F-sharp. We use the bracket bar syntax, as you can see here. In order to make type inference work, you have to provide at least one item in the initializer. And if you omit the data, then F# -sharp will create an open generic array type, which isn't really useful. And we'll see a better approach for creating an empty array a little bit later. The items you want to initialize the array with must be delimited with semicolons. And you can omit the final semicolon, or include it if you like, and all the items must be the same type, or have cast applied to them to make them all the same type. You can also create arrays by placing each item on a separate line. And when you use this form, you can omit all the semicolon operators, or include them. Again, they're optional here. Finally, you can specify a sequence range in the form of a start to end, or start to increment to end, and this will populate the array with a specified range as you can see here. And this is a combination of the allocation and initialize of the array in a single F-sharp statement. And it turns out that there's some methods you can use to create arrays as well using the collection.array module. And this is the F-sharp library that supplements the array functionality. So you can create an empty array with array.empty, and this returns an empty array of a specified type. You can create and initialize an array with a specified number of repeated values. You can create and initialize an array with zeros for a specific size, or you can create and initialize an array with a set number of values supplied by a function. And once you have an array created, you can access the elements within it using the dot operator and a zero base index where zero is the first item in the array. And this syntax will likely look a little bit odd to you coming from C-sharp as we place the dot before the bracket indexer. And this is quite a powerful construct, however. You can retrieve a single item, as shown in the first example, or return a subsection of the array using three different patterns. You can use a range of inclusive indexes, like 0 to 2, which returns three values. You can use a range of items up to a specific inclusive index by omitting the first number or all items starting at a particular index by omitting the last number. And keep in mind that with the subsection syntax, the array returned actually might be empty. Arrays in F-sharp are fixed in size and shape, just like C-sharp, 
And in order to resize the array, you must recreate it and copy all of the values over. However, unlike most data structures in F-sharp, the data in the array itself is mutable. And this makes total sense if you think about it, since the underlying array type is mutable. And you can use the assignment operator, that's the less than followed by the dash, to alter a value by index position, as you can see here where we change the second item to be a new value. And where the real power and flexibility of these data structures shines through is in the operations we can perform on the data. And most of the functions we'll look at are actually applied to lists and sequences as well and fall into three basic categories. The first category is filtering data. And this is where we take an array and provide some kind of filter to decide what to keep and what to ignore. And generally a filter produces fewer outputs than inputs. And this is similar in nature to the link where method. The output from this type of operation will be a new array of the same type that contains only the matching elements. The next category is transforming data. So this is where we provide a transformation function which is executed on the collection and produces some output for each item. We sometimes call this a projection and it's similar to the link select method. And the concept of transforming is really the bread and butter of F sharp. It's something you'll constantly be doing. And the output from this type of operation will be a new array of some type. And our last category is processing data. This is where we have a function which is executed for each item in the array, potentially creating side effects. And it's different than a transform because it must return no value. And this is similar to the list for each method. So let's look at each style in turn. Filtering data is performed using the array.filter function. This takes a predicate function which takes an item from the array and returns a Boolean result indicating that it matches the filter. And the equivalent in C-sharp would be a where link function. And you can either pass a function tied to a value or an anonymous function, like you can see here. And in this code here, we're checking to see if the value passed is evenly divisible by 2. And remember that a single equal sign in F-sharp indicates equality, not assignment. And the function must return a true or false result, which determines whether the specific item being tested is returned in the resulting array. And the second parameter to the filter method is the array itself. And this can be passed as a parameter, as you can see here, or using a pipe operator, which is also very common in F-sharp. And the result from this filter function would be just the even numbers between 0 and 12. Next, we can transform elements. This produces an array of equal size to the original and is done using the built-in array.map function. This is called a projection in functional terms, and like the filtering operation, requires a function to do its work. The function in this case is one that takes a T, which represents each item, and returns a U, which represents the transformed item. So the resulting type can be the same as the input, or you can change the data to some other type as part of the transformation. And in this example, we pass a lambda function, which doubles each input value, producing an array with integers from 0 to 10 incremented by 2. Finally, we can perform some kind of processing on the array. And this is done with the array.iter function, which takes a, a function as a parameter. And the function itself can do whatever it likes to the input values. However, it must return nothing. So that's the unit result. And in this case here, we're just passing a function that prints out each value to the console. Finally, there are a bunch of aggregate functions similar to what you might find in Link to perform operations on arrays. And most of these are mathematical in nature, such as the minimum, maximum, sum. But we also have sorting, concatenation, folding accumulators, searching, partitioning, permutations, and map reduce capabilities. And as you can tell, the collections.array module is quite robust and it's really worth checking out the documentation on all its features. Now we talked a little bit about pipelining in the very first class and this is a feature of F -sharp where we can take the results from one function and then feed or pipe it into the next function to get a result or result set. And this is a really powerful feature that you'll find yourself using more often as you become familiar with F -sharp and functional programming. So let's take a quick look at a few simple examples. In this example, we use the pipeline operator to chain two functions off an array of integer representing the numbers between 0 to 4. 
Now the first function filters the array to produce only the even numbers, and the next one then sums all the even numbers to produce a single result, which is 6. And here you can see we're placing each operation on a separate line, which is quite common for readability. However, you can also string them on a single line as well. One of the interesting features that you can leverage is array.parallel. And this takes an array in a processing function and partitions the items in the array across multiple background threads based on the number of items and also the number of CPUs. And this supports built on top of the task parallel library in .NET 4 and performs the operation on chunks of the data. For example, here you can see we're grabbing all of the text files from the root directory using .NET's system.io.directory.get files and then running them all through the file encrypt method. So when executed, the system would parcel out different file names to different threads, taking into account the number of CPUs and the input-output processing taking place. So the, the TPL uses heuristics to determine that more threads need to be created in order to process the work. And this is quite cool and fairly easy to use, but you have to keep a, a few important things in mind. First, the unit of work has to be sufficiently costly to see performance gains. And because we're spinning up the thread pool threads and dispatching the work onto delegate functions, there's an overhead cost to doing that. And if the work is minimal, then it's very likely that this will actually degrade the performance rather than improve it. Second, you can't have any dependencies on the processing order. So in other words, each item must be able to be processed in any order without affecting any of the other elements. And this is actually easy to do in f -sharp just because of the mutability rules, but it's something you need to keep in mind. And the equivalent functionality in c -sharp would be using TPL's parallel.4 and also parallel.4 each, and the .as parallel link method. So we've looked at arrays. Now let's just examine a similar data structure, the list. Now lists are similar to arrays in that they hold homogeneous data. However, the underlying structure is actually a linked list where each node has a single item and a pointer to the next item. Now in addition, unlike arrays, F-sharp lists are immutable. So adding or removing items from the list always results in a new list structure. And F-sharp doesn't use the traditional .NET list class uh, as a data structure to manage this data. Instead, it uses an internal class named f -sharp list, and this was created specifically to support the immutability preferences of the language. However, we don't work directly with this class. Instead, f -sharp provides a built-in syntax to manage lists. And the syntax used to create an f -sharp list is similar to an array. We use brackets around a series of semicolon delimited values or a range expression. And you'll notice that we didn't include the parallel bars. That's what turns this into a list instead of an array. And lists are great for certain types of data access. First, they're dynamic in nature, so you can add as many items as you like to the list without defining any length. They have many of the same methods and capabilities as arrays, but the access time is a bit slow because the, the list must be traversed to find the data. And because of that, f -sharp provides methods to convert back and forth between lists and arrays. And it's very common to initially create a list for new data, and then once you've completed the collection, turn that into an array to more quickly index the data. To add a new item to the list, we use the cons operator. And the cons operator is a double colon in the language syntax. And this adds new items to the head of the list and returns a new list. So when a new element is added, it's actually creating a single node with a reference to the first element of the previous list, rather than copying the entire data structure. And since we're really only allocating a new node and linking it together, this operation happens in constant time, referred to as O1. That's actually really fast. Again, f -sharp provides a language syntax for this capability, which you can see being used here. We start with the list 1 to 4, and then prepend the zero value, creating a new list. There's no corresponding operator to append to the end of the list, primarily because this is a very inefficient operation on a singly linked list. There is, however, an ability to combine two lists, and this is done with a concatenation operator, which in F-sharp is the at symbol. And it takes two lists and returns a third list, which links them together. The concat operator supports either list being empty, in which case it just returns the other list, or it will create a new list, 
which contains the chains from the two pass lists. And again, the data itself is not copied, it just links them together with a new node in between them. The original lists are actually unaffected. So what if you need to actually append to your list? And you can certainly use this capability to add single items to the end, but it would actually be fairly slow to do that. Instead, it's much faster to generate your list using the cons operator and then reverse it once you have all the data with the list.reverse function, or REV. Now alternatively, if you absolutely need a full read-write list, you can always use the list class from the .NET framework. You can even create that and turn it into an f -sharp list or array once you've got all the data loaded. And a list has several unique operations you can perform on it. As an example, look at the code shown here. We're defining a recursive function using the rec keyword, and a recursive function is one that calls itself. And in this case, we're using it to sum a list of values in a list. Now to do that, we're using a pattern matching expression, and you'll learn about pattern matching in a future module, but you can see it started here with the match keyword. And this expression takes our past list and checks to see if it's empty. That's the first match expression with the open close brackets. So when it's empty, we return zero, as you can see here in the lambda associated with this match expression. The second expression uses the cons pattern. That's the head tail syntax. And this style of pattern is only available to lists, and it's used to decompose a list into the first element that represents the head, and a list that contains the remainder of the elements, or the tail. Since this is a linked list data structure, this is quite easy to do. In fact, there are properties on the list to return these two pieces of information directly. The function passed to this pattern takes the head value and then calls sum recursively on the rest of the list. And this will then iterate through every item on the list doing the same match. And the final result assigned to the total value will be the final sum value returned. Array and list have a lot in common. However, list is a much better choice in certain circumstances. The main benefits of using a list is when you're manipulating the head node, particularly adding a new node to the front using the cons operator. As mentioned a moment ago, these operations are done in an order of magnitude of 1 by changing the list locally only. In an array, the remainder of the array needs to be copied. On the other side, seeking in a list means following the links in ON, whereas in an array, the desired position can be computed mathematically and accessed very quickly. In addition, arrays are mutable and can have their values changed, whereas list nodes are immutable, and changing a node means generating a new list with the new node. And lists are really only usable in f -sharp, so even though there's a .NET class underneath the list structure, it's not easily usable from c -sharp. If you want to do interoperability, you'd use arrays. Now finally, if you have large lists, Keep in mind that memory usage is also different. Each element of a list has more overhead since pointers to the next element is also stored. Arrays don't have this overhead, however arrays take up as much memory as is allocated for the capacity, regardless of whether elements have actually been added or not. So if you don't know how much data you'll have, use a list to create the data. Remember you can always turn a list into an array later. So let's begin work on our first lab. In this lab, you'll get some experience working with the array and list types in f -sharp. So now, pause the video, and when you've done everything, then resume the video and we'll review the contents. So let's review the completed solution. So we need to assign a value to an array, which are the, the numbers 0 to 100. So we're going to use the range. So we'll define let the numbers equal, and we're defining an array with a square bracket and bar syntax. 0 to 100. We'll then filter these numbers to create an array that represents the even numbers only. And we'll use the array.filter method passing in a function where we determine if the number is evenly divisible by 2 by using the modulus operator. So we'll use the array.filter, pass in the function and where n doesn't have a remainder. And we'll use the single equals, which means checking for equality. And then we'll pass in the, the numbers after that. And we'll then print the output using the printfn function to the window.
So the sum is, and this is an integer we're dealing with, and we'll pass in array.sum evens. And that should be the, the value there. So let's execute that in the REPL. We'll select all that. Send the selection to the F sharp interactive. And here we can see the value. So the sum is 2550. We've got our numbers. And we've also got our evens as well. Now we could also optimize this code to be a little bit more functional using pipelining. So we'll review pipelining a little bit more in today's class, but let's actually just optimize that. So we don't need to really define any variables. We could use the, the pipelining to just push these operations together. And here we could use the array sum and then output that array sum into the print fn call without the need for parameters. So let's execute that code as well. And there we can see the, the values coming through. So pipelining is where you use the output of one operation as the input to the next operation. So here we're pipelining the array to the array filter, to the array sum, and then pipelining that to the printfn function. Now let's move on to the, the next part. Just going to create a, a new file, a new script file in this project. Lab 1, part 2. So we'll need to create a couple of lists. And we'll create the first list using the list syntax, and then create the second list by creating an array, and then converting that array into a list. So we'll define our first list, and we'll use just the single bracket, and then the numbers separated by semicolons. There's our list. I need to add the, the let operation, of course. Let list 2. And this is going to use the array to list. And then I'll pass in a new arrow. So here I'll, I'll use the square bracket and bar combination. And define the values here too. and then close that array off and match the parentheses. Let create another list, list three, which is list one and list two being connected together. So we'll then calculate the average using a number of techniques. So we'll first use the list average by, so I can use the list dot average by. So I want to print that directly. I'll also use the printfn function. And I'll say the average is and put in a floating point value and then pass in the, the average by. So I'll need to pass in a function to this as well. And I'll just use n. Convert that to a float. And then pass in the list. And it's list 3 that I'm averaging it by. And then I've got a few other mechanisms I'll use as well. I'll print out using the average and also the map. So the average by is actually the combination of average and map. So this will be actually very similar to this code. I'm going to use first average and then I'll use list.map and just basically map the, the functions to a float. We'll then calculate it using the sum divided by the list length. And we need to make sure that the sum and the length are both the same types. So I'll define the sum first. And I'll just use the list sum function and then pass in the, the list. And then I'll just print out the average again. 
So here we've got the float, and then we'll pass in the sum. We'll make sure it's of the type float as well, and we'll divide that by the list length. And we'll also make sure that that list length is returned as a float. And then we'll implement it lastly using pipelining. And this is the way you'll find yourself writing most code as you become more familiar with F Sharp. So we'll go to list three, we'll pipeline that to the list average by, and we'll pass that the float value to average, and then we'll pipe that into the printf end function. And there's our implementation. Let's go ahead and we'll just quickly run this in the REPL. We'll need the, the double semicolons, of course. And we'll send that selection to F Sharp Interactive. And there's our values, nice and consistent, each calculating the average the same way. So in this last objective, we looked at arrays and lists in F Sharp, and we also got a chance to use them in action in a lab exercise. Arrays and lists are the two most common structures that you'll use, but F Sharp has several other useful data structures that you should be aware of. And we're going to cover four data structure types. We're going to look at tuples to store discrete values together. We'll look at sequences to hold large enumerable data sequences. We'll look at records to create quick types and also discriminated unions for closed value sets. So let's look at tuples. And a tuple is a data structure that has a specific number and sequence of elements. And we've got several examples of tuples shown here. And you'll notice that the syntax we use to create a tuple is to surround a common delimited set of data with parentheses. And in our first example, we store two integer values, then three strings. And the three elements is known as a three tuple or a triple. The third example is more representative of how we use tuples in programming. And this one is being used to store an identifier, such as a person's name in the first element, a year in the second element, and the person's income for that year in the third element. And this could be then returned from a function as one piece of data. And tuples are commonly used in three ways. First, to represent a single set of data with fields, such as database records with columns, without having to create a new type to hold the data. They can also be used to return multiple values from a function, and also to pass multiple values to a function through a single parameter. And when you create a tuple in F Sharp using the language syntax, it generates a standard tuple using the .NET tuple class. And this allows you to pass tuples back and forth with other languages too. .NET supports tuples with one to seven elements. And once you hit that limit, F Sharp will make the final parameter an embedded tuple continuing to nest the data structures in order to fit the number of items supplied. And functions will often use the tuple form for passing and accepting parameters. This allows us to efficiently pass multiple values without the need to create a custom type as we often have to in C Sharp. In addition to the simple creation syntax, F Sharp also provides two keywords, FST and SND to retrieve the first and second items from a pair tuple. You can use either the keywords as a function, as shown in the top example, or with pipelining, which is more common. Interestingly, there's no function available to retrieve the third or subsequent elements, and in fact, you can only use these keywords if the tuple is a pair of elements. Instead, we use pattern matching to pull elements out of tuples. F Sharp allows us to assign tuple positions to name values directly. Here we're taking a tuple with two integer values and assigning the first element to A and the second element to B and then printing them out to the console. And if you're only interested in some of the elements, you can use an underscore to ignore that positional value. This is the wildcard character in F Sharp. And here you'll see we're only getting the third value and ignoring the first two elements in the tuple. When processing tuples, it's quite common to pattern match with a full match expression as you can see here and depending on the parameters passed, we'll get different results from our greeting function. Pass in Yoda, and no matter what language, and we get greetings master. Pass in English or Klingon, and we get the translated greeting. And pass in anything else that starts with span, and we get Spanish.
apologies to Star Wars and Star Trek purist um obviously we shouldn't be mixing the two worlds but hopefully you can see it's a good example of where we can use pattern matching f sharp is a special type signature to represent a tuple it uses asterisks as separators between the types making up the tuple definition so for example here you can see a tuple being defined with several different types and the actual type signature will have these types included with asterisk separators as you can see here Another common data structure that you'll use in F-sharp is the sequence type. And the sequence is a set of homogeneous values that can be iterated in a forward-only, read-only fashion. And the equivalent representation in C-sharp is the I enumerable interface. And in fact, this is exactly how F-sharp models sequences under the covers. And we create sequences using the seek keyword with curly braces around our semicolon separated values or expression used to populate the sequence and in many ways they work just like lists and arrays that we saw earlier. So why do you need a sequence? First, sequences are evaluated only when you access them and this provides for a unique optimization when dealing with very large amounts of data that you need to process. Much like iterator methods in C-sharp, you only incur the calculation cost to get the data when you access the element at that position. And this makes it ideal for certain types of scientific processing, such as genomics, or when you're working with algorithms that have infinite sequences. We only allocate memory to hold what we need to process. Unlike arrays and lists, sequences do not allocate memory to hold the entire data set. Instead, they're often populated with functions that calculate the values as necessary, or pull the values from an external source when requested. And there are a few common ways we generate sequences in f -sharp. And we can create sequences from calculating functions. So as an example, consider the function to calculate Fibonacci numbers. Here, we're using a built-in function from the collections.sequence class to create an infinite function which is passed an index. And when you iterate the resulting sequence, each value is calculated using the pass index starting with zero. And it always starts with zero, however, you can adjust the index inside the function if you need it to be offset by some value. And despite the name, the function actually isn't infinite because the index passed is always assigned 32-bit integer value. So you're really limited to the range of zero to in32 max value. Another way to create a sequence is through the collections.sequence.unfold method, which uses the previous value to calculate the next position. In this case, we take an initial value, which is 1 in this case, and return that value plus 2. And this is a never-ending sequence. As long as you request the next number, you'll get a value equal to the previous number plus 2. We can also generate sequences from anything that's enumerable. As an example, most input-output classes in .NET return enumerable data. Here, we're reading all the lines from a text file named cheeses using the system.io.file.readLineStatic method. And then we take the resulting i enumerable of string and turn that into a sequence of string using the sequence.cast method. It turns out the sequence.cast is not necessary in our code since F -sharp will implicitly turn enumerables into sequences. However, it does make the code more readable and obvious and in some cases might be necessary if the type returned implements i enumerable but is some higher level type. Finally, we can also generate sequences through explicit values using the yield keyword. And this is similar to iterator methods in C-sharp. Anything you can yield will be returned from the sequence. And there's also a yield exclamation, which is similar to link select many function. It creates a subsequence which is merged into the primary sequence. So the final result is a sequence of type sequence of a generic type. A variation on the yield keyword is to combine it with an expression. Here you can see some code to create squares from 1 to 10, which return a tuple containing the original value and also its square. We then use the built-in sequence.iter method to iterate the sequence, passing an evaluation function. And this is similar to the list for each method in C Sharp. Sequences, much like arrays and lists, have a bunch of operations you can perform on them, and many of them match the capabilities of their list and array counterparts. For example, if we assume that nums here is a sequence from 1 to 20, you can see operations to average, to get the minimum value, to sort, and also to sum the sequence. Now you could of course use a for and do loop to iterate through the sequence to produce the same functionality, but here it's built in, 
and it's also available for your program to use. So let's use some of these features in a lab exercise. Let's move on to an exercise where we use sequences to calculate the number of dots in a triangle. And we're going to start with an initial dot, and then each successive iteration will add a dot to the bottom left and to the bottom right to expand the triangle. And that's going to affect the total number of dots that are created. So just like before, go ahead and pause the video while you do the exercise. And when you've completed the lab, then you can resume the video and we'll review the, the contents of the lab. Okay, good luck. For this lab, we need to write a function that takes a tuple holding the current state of the sequence as well as a counter to the next number that we'll be adding. Now you would have seen that we need to return an option type. Now we haven't looked at option types just yet, but we will in F sharp 104. But you can think of option types like nullable types in C sharp, where some refers to having a value and none refers to not having a value. So let's write our function. So we'll add the, the triangle numbers, and we'll pass in the tuple, the state, and the counter. And that's going to equal a sum value, which means we have a value, and we'll return the state, and then the state plus the counter plus 1 to increase the amount of dots. And we'll also increment the, the next state as well. Now we'll then create the sequence setting the initial value as well. And this will use the sequence unfold technique. And then we'll pass in the, the function itself. And pass in the initial values. And finally, we'll use that sequence and then extract some values from it. Now we're going to use the sequence.take method to take a number of elements and then convert that into a list. So I've got the triangulars. And we'll use some pipelining here. So I'll use the sequence.take. We'll take 10 elements. And then we'll convert that to a list with the sequence to list method. We'll go ahead and run that in the REPL, so we'll select all that, send the selection to F-Sharp Interactive, and there we can see our, our sequence of the number of dots as the triangles grow. Let's move on to another common data structure that you'll use in F-Sharp, records. And records are named values associated together. And they're a little bit like tuples, except the values have names assigned to them and have a formal definition using the type keyword. And when you define a record, you can either use a single line with semicolon delimiters for the values that you want to include, or you can put each defined value on a separate line and omit the semicolon. And under the covers, records create public classes in .NET with public properties for each value. And once you have a record definition, you can then begin to define new values using that record. And here's an example where we use the person record we defined in the previous slide with an ID, a name, and an email. And you'll notice that we don't have to indicate the record type. And this is inferred by F-Sharp automatically based on what's been defined in the program up until this point. Remember, we have a specific file and function ordering requirement in F-Sharp. By simply using the field names, F-Sharp figures out which records that you're using. And this leads to an interesting problem. What if we have two records which are really similar? Here, for example, we have a point and a point three record defined. And both of these which define an X and a Y value. And when I go and create an instance, F sharp is going to complain because it doesn't know which record we're using. It has two to choose from. In this case, we need to provide a hint. And that's done by putting a prefix on one of the values to indicate which record it comes from. And you don't need to do it to every field, just one suffice. And this gives F sharp enough information to break the ambiguity and create the record. And you can also put the hint after the curly brace for that point record as well. As mentioned earlier, records are actually implemented as unique public classes in the CLR. And one of the features F-Sharp adds to the generated class is a quality comparison support. This allows you to compare two record instances for a quality based solely on the values. In this example here, we have two defined point values, point 0.1 and point 0.2. And since they have the same field values for X and Y, 
and a quality test will return true. But under the covers, f -sharp is actually implementing a variety of interfaces, including iComparable and iEquatable, and this means that the comparison support actually works with other .NET languages too. By default, the defined property values only have a getter, kind of like an anonymous type in c -sharp. However, it's possible to define a setter as well through the mutable keyword, and this allows the property to be changed at runtime. Lastly, we can copy records, kind of like a clone operation, to generate a new instance of a record with some possibly changed values. Here we have a record with the values mark, one, and a date. We can then create a new record named Jen, which is based on mark. And this record has all the same values except the name has been changed. And you can, of course, just create a new record copying all the values over on your own as well. This is just a nice shortcut when you're duplicating certain values or wanting to update a record which has immutable properties. Let's see how we can use records in this exercise. Just like before, pause the video and when you finish the exercise, we'll review the materials. In this lab, we're going to create a record that has two values. A starting point, which is a tuple that represents the X and Y starting points. And move, a function that takes a starting point and a tuple that will be used to calculate a new position. So let's define the record and we'll define the type point transformation and we'll use the curly braces to indicate it is a record we'll then add the starting point and move now a starting point is a tuple we'll need to use the the asterisk syntax and as move is a function we'll have to define the types we expect and also the type that we'll return in this case we'll take two tuples and return a tuple so here's the starting point and there'll be a tuple of two floats. And then I'll have move, which is a function that takes two tuples. And then returns a tuple as well of floats. And then we'll close the, the record definition. We'll then define our first implementation by defining the adding record. So we'll let adding equal to a new record. We'll define the starting point as equal to 1.2. And we'll define move as a new function, taking the starting point and the displacement. and then working out the, the appropriate distance. should be right to end the record there and there's our definition so here we've got a starting point of one and two and a move function that just adds the difference from the second tuple to the first tuple we then add the subtracting where we copy the fields from adding but replace the move function with ones that subtract the values using the second tuple redefine the, the move function which is really just a subtraction process here. And let's send that to the REPL just to confirm and that works nicely. The last data structure style that we're going to look at is the discriminated union or DU for short. And this is a special type in F-sharp that defines a closed set of values sort of like an enumeration in C-sharp. And in the code block shown, you can see we're defining a bunch of fruit values, and I'm sure you can imagine what the equivalent enumeration would look like in C-sharp. However, it's far more capable than it appears in this example here. In fact, even though it looks similar to an enumeration under the covers, it's a full-blown class that provides for some really powerful capabilities. You use a discriminated union just like you would a constant value. 
F-sharp infers what you're working with, although you can preface the value with a type name if necessary to qualify it. And unlike C-sharp enumerations, you can only select a valid value from a discriminated union. There's no casting support, and the underlying values are not numeric. In fact, under the covers, F-sharp creates a class named fruit, which has a public property of type fruit for each of the valid values. And this makes it a completely closed set with no ability to add or remove values without redefining the discriminated union. And you'll notice in this code example here, when you print the discriminated union value out, you get the textual name from the value, and it also implements equality and comparison support, so you can compare them as value types. So let's look a little closer at what we can do with discriminated unions. First, because each value ends up being a class, we can actually define different types to be associated with each value. As an example, consider a shape definition where I'd want to support different shape types, but each type has some specific data I want to associate with it. The circle has a float radius, the square has an integer size, and the rectangle has a tuple that represents the width and the height. And this definition then allows me to supply specific values which I assign the shape type. So that when I define a shape, I can specify the radius for a circle and the size for a rectangle. And this is a really powerful feature. In fact, you'll find that many F-sharp programmers will use discriminated unions in place of typical object-orientated programming hierarchies, mainly because we can include custom data like this. And when we assign the discriminated union type, we also provide the data to go along with it. And you'll notice that we use parentheses to supply the tuple for the rectangle shape. You can also shortcut the definition and leave off the field name, providing for an anonymous field on the discriminated union. And this changes how we supply the data as well, since the fields are unnamed. f -sharp will instead expect that you pass the data in order. And when you add value-specific data like this, f -sharp will still generate static properties. However, each property will actually be a unique class definition, deriving from an abstract base class. So in this example here, we'd have an abstract base type named shape, and a derived class named circle, which includes a float property, a derived class named square, with an unsigned int32 property, and a derived class named rectangle, with a tuple property. And this is exactly what you might do in an OO environment, but it's all done for you and much easier to define and use. You might be asking, can we add multiple values? And for that, the answer is yes. And the syntax looks like this. We use the asterisk to separate the field definitions. And here, we're defining a new prism shape that includes both a width and a height, both of type double. We then allocate the prism, passing the two parameters, passed in just like a tuple, but f sharp recognize that it's two separate parameters in this case. You can even leave off the names and use positional values, although adding names makes it a little bit easier to work with. So let's try using discriminated unions in an exercise. And the purpose of this exercise is to convert a C-sharp object-orientated hierarchy of classes into an F-sharp equivalent using discriminated unions. Just like before, pause the video, do the exercise, and when you finish the exercise, resume the video and we'll review. Let's have a look at this exercise. And we've got the registration project. It has a series of classes, like registrant, and this is the abstract class. We've got a few others inheriting from registrant as well, like attendee, speaker, and volunteer. And you can see attendee requires an email. Uh, registrant doesn't actually have any additional information, but the speaker has a title and also a room where the volunteer has no extra additional information. Now the version for F sharp is actually a lot more concise. If we look at this definition done using a discriminated union, we've got the registrant, we've also got the attendee, and we're supplying the email, we've got the volunteer that doesn't require any more additional information, and we've also got the speaker that has a title and also the room. And if you look at the, the total lines of code, we've gone from 49 lines of C-sharp code down to four lines of F-sharp. So you can see discriminated unions are a very awesome feature of F-sharp. So let's test our knowledge with a little flash quiz. Question one, what symbol do you use to separate components in a tuple? 
Is it A, B or C? And the answer is option C, it's the asterisk symbol. Question two, records, and you'll need to answer all that apply here. A can have multiple constructors, B cannot be compared, C can contain different types of data, or D are immutable. And the answers are C, they can contain different types of data, and D, they're immutable. Question 3. Which of these two examples employ the proper syntax of the record expression? And the answer is the second option, that A and B are both correct. So you've just had a look at some of the core data structures in f -sharp. Tuples, sequences, records, and discriminated unions. In your next steps, you'll actually learn how to use pattern matching, and you saw some examples of that today. And you'll also be introduced to an amazing concept in f -sharp called partial application. Thanks for watching this video on data structures with f -sharp. I've been Glenn Stevens, and thanks again for watching another video from Xamarin University.